This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvaggi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Framed as a response to the massive disruption created by the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. House of Representatives recently signed and forwarded to the Senate the so-called Build Back Better Act. The healthcare provisions in the bill seek to make healthcare more affordable by preserving American Rescue Plan insurance and expanding eligibility and benefits for Medicaid and Affordable Care Act plans. The question for policy analysts is to determine whether the act's changes target those most in need in the wake of the pandemic, or whether the act's provisions simply shift costs from the private to the public sector, potentially accelerating the total cost of healthcare in America. My guest today is Josh Archambault, Senior Fellow for Healthcare Policy at Pioneer Institute. Mr. Archambault has written extensively about the federal and state policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and has analyzed the healthcare provisions in the Build Back Better Act. Josh will share with us his views on the likely impact of this pending legislation and offer insight on how policymakers could design alternative legislation to better serve the needs of healthcare consumers. When I return, I'll be joined by Pioneer Institute's Josh Archambault. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Silvaggi, and I'm now joined by Pioneer Institute's Senior Fellow of Healthcare Policy, Josh Archambault. Welcome back to Hubwonk, Josh. It's really my pleasure to be back, Joe. Thanks. Well, it's good to have you. We're going to talk about some very, very big bills today. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what's recently passed in the House, the Build Back Better Act, uh, and what has recently passed before that, the um, uh, ARPA, um, American Rescue uh, Plan Act. Um, both big, big bills. I think the price tag on Build Back Better is uh, roughly $2 trillion. Uh, and uh, so a good portion of that has to do with healthcare, which is your expertise. Um, now, let's start at a very high level when we're talking about uh, Build Back Better uh, with regard to healthcare. What is the aspiration of this, the, this bill? What are we trying to do uh, as it affects healthcare in America? Great question, Joe. Um, and I think you might get 100 different answers if you ask members of Congress what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, these bills are just so large uh, with so many different provisions. I, I think the ones that probably are of biggest note um, are largely around expanding coverage, kind of, quote unquote, building on the ACA or Obamacare. And some of those major provisions in particular make the ACA subsidies available to a lot more Americans up to a much higher income level than were previously available, both in Massachusetts and nationally. So going forward, we're going to have a situation where there are employers who are looking at this situation um, and saying, should I continue to even offer insurance? Because many more of their employees now can access these taxpayer funded subsidies. So that's, that's a big piece of it. The other one is Democrats' efforts in particular to try to get some sort of coverage option for folks that live in states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so they open a pathway for those individuals to access the ACA subsidies for the first time as well. And that's going to be quite costly um, versus if you were to extend a coverage to those individuals on Medicaid, which tend to have a much more stricter and lower prices and reimbursements for care that's provided. We're going to have a very, very large bill as a result of this. In fact, the Congressional Budget Office, when it weighed in, said that they expect to have this bill spend about $19,000 per new life who's gaining coverage going forward. And unfortunately, about 75% of those people already have some sort of coverage. So there's a lot of shifting around, just like there was under the ACA, of where people are getting coverage in a very cost costly manner to do so. And so this obviously raises questions about sustainability going forward, because the last piece I would kind of highlight here is what they did to make the bill not look quite as costly is they only made some of these expansions temporary, only a few years out. And so we're going to have the joy of watching if this ends up passing the Senate in some form similar to what passed the House, we're going to be <laughs> watching this debate play itself out uh, right around election cycles uh, in the near future. Sure. I've, I've heard many accounts when people try to nail down how much this uh, massive bill will cost. I've heard uh, anything uh, as low as $2 trillion. That sounds like a big number, but that's the low end, all the way to $5 trillion, uh, if we were to extend all these subsidies out uh, for, for 10 years. 
so let's let's go deeper. When we talk about subsidies and uh, trying to get more people on, let's say, Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, um, how do we do this? Do we, in a sense, uh, um, uh, write people a check so that they can mail it to the insurance company, or um, you know, what, what's the dynamic? Do we, or do we move them on to like a Medicaid type program where it's entirely subsidized and and in a sense waive restrictions? How does the government actually make uh, healthcare more affordable um, on, on the ground? Sure. So the the way that this is handled is through one small little tweak, if you will, in in the actual rules and regulations. And so in essence, what the, the House bill did is it said that uh, under the ACA, if you have to spend more than 9.5% of your income towards health insurance, towards the cost of uh, health insurance, uh, then you could actually access the subsidies. So it's actually income-based. So up to a certain income level, 400% of the federal poverty level. Um, but then if you had to spend more than 9.5%, you could also access them. Well, what this bill does is it actually lowers it to 8.5%. So it lowers that threshold. So this is the kind of boring details of how who actually qualifies or not. So, so what then actually happens? If you fall into one of those buckets, if you're in one of these states where they're allowing you to access it, maybe the first time um, in this income gap previously where you didn't qualify, well, you go to the ACA you look at and shop the plans, and then you pick a plan, and then the insurance company will receive a check from the government to cover a certain percentage of the cost of the plan. And as you have a higher income level, it co covers a little bit less. In essence, though, what ends up happening here is that it, the, well, the patient or the enrollee is protected from having ever increasing amount of out-of-pocket costs, the insurance company just gets a bigger and bigger check if the premium goes up. And so there are some serious problems here with sustainability and the cost per life to be able to cover these individuals. And in the House bill, they want to make it as, quote unquote, as affordable as possible. So the out-of-pocket responsibility, the cost sharing requirements to get all of the technical terms in there for the patients are very, very low. In essence, what that means is larger and larger amounts of taxpayer money is going directly to the insurance company to help pay for and make it hold harmless, if you will, the individual enrollee, but at the cost to the taxpayers. So I just want to restate what you said um, uh, in layman's terms. So I, let's say I um, um, and make $100,000 a year, and uh, whereas uh, the old test would have been um, eligible for ACA, uh, subsidies at uh, it was nine and a half percent. So if they cost more than uh, it cost healthcare costs more than ninety five hundred dollars to me, uh, the um, uh, subsidies kicking. Now we've moved it down to eight or eight and a half percent. So if it's eight thousand or eighty five hundred dollars, uh, then they kick in earlier. But what you're saying is uh, that portion of my income goes to my uh, insurance company. What goes beyond that? The subsidy itself. Uh, that's not constrained. Uh, the insurance company says you've got a $20,000 premium or a $10,000 premium. Um, there's no constraint on that. So the government either writes that firm, that insurance firm, a $1,500 check if it's a $10,000 premium or a um, $12,000 check if it's a $20,000 premium. Do, do I have that right? Is that the dynamic? So you're very, very close. Really, the percent of your income is actually just whether you qualify or not. Once you then enter the ACA exchange, how much subsidy you get is based on your income. And it's not quite as um, analogous as you just kind of made connected the dots. So you may actually get more subsidy as a result than you would have paid. This is actually, for Massachusetts listeners, this is actually an interesting historical um, comparison. Because under Rom, so-called Romney care in Massachusetts, this whole discussion was uh, very black and white. If you were offered employer-based insurance, you could not qualify for a subsidy. End of story. And the rationale behind that was is they did not want to impact whether employers, small employers in particular, offered insurance. They wanted to reserve the subsidies to be spent for those that were uninsured or simply were having to buy insurance on their own and could not afford it. They wanted employers to keep their commitment to continue to offer insurance. The federal law took a different approach, which we have just kind of talked through the different approach that they've taken, which is a little bit more complicated to run the math. But the end result is a lot more people, especially under what passed the House bill, a lot more people qualify. And it puts tremendous pressure on those small companies who 
if you go to any chamber of commerce breakfast or anything else, constantly say healthcare costs are by far one of my biggest expenses. And it is something that they wish would, in theory, just kind of go away or have a little bit more certainty for what it used to be 30 years ago or 20 years ago. And so what I think is concerning about potentially what happens if this becomes law long term is that you have a whole lot of employers who not only have uncertainty about what the federal government's role is going to be and who qualifies because of the timelines, the temporary timelines that they put into this. And business wants certainty. That's how they plan and move forward. But second, you have now set up the situation where you have a lot more taxpayer-funded money going towards a higher income group of individuals who didn't qualify for these subsidies long-term. And there could be some unintended consequences for the lower income communities or others in which their accessing coverage is a problem. And the final thing that I would say here, Joe, and wrote a piece about this for Forbes, is that there are some concerns that this expansion actually is worse for people with pre-existing conditions. And let me explain that for one second. For individuals who have a pre-existing condition who are employer-based insurance in general, they not only have more robust coverage, but they have lower out-of-pocket costs. When we looked at and compared the plans that were on the ACA versus the plans that are typically offered by small employers, we found that for people with pre-existing conditions who will, again, the incentives are aligned for them to be pushed into the exchange and off their employer-based insurance, for them, they will have fewer options of providers to go see. So their current providers may not be available to them. And second, they will probably pay a lot more money out of pocket under the ACA plans than they would under their employer plans. So there's some real unintended consequences. I'm not sure Congress has fully internalized as they expand up the subsidy ladder into the increasingly into the middle class. Um, um, so forgive me, Josh, I'm a little bit confused because again, I used to be an employer and uh, we offered plans for our employees. We, we were very happy effectively to subsidize individual employees and engendered a, a sense of loyalty and, uh, and professionalism. Um, so is, is employer-based insurance uh, something we're trying to encourage or discourage, or whether we're intending to do it, will this have the effect of having more employers provide it or just walk away and say, look, uh, because of the uncertainty and because I can't compete with the uh, uh, federal subsidies, uh, I'm going to get out of the uh, business of insuring or helping to insure my employees? Yeah, these are very good questions, Joe. So there's probably two conversations to be had on this one. The first one is your first point about is employer-based insurance the model that we actually want going forward? And I'll just say there are pros and cons to the system. Um, I, I think that uh, there have been real challenges with the dysfunction that we see in our healthcare market that are slightly dr that are driven by, in part, by the way that we have set up the tax benefit nature of employer-based insurance. In, in essence, just to put uh, in a sentence, what the, the problem is is that the patient is disconnected from the cost because really the person who is buying the plan is the HR department or the CEO of the company. So the insurance company is not really interested in being patient-centered. It's really interested in what the CEO or the HR department is gonna offer their employees. That has led to some big unintended consequences. Unfortunately, that has led to some of the dysfunction. So that's one conversation. The second conversation relates to this bill in particular. And it says, okay, well, let's say that for the sake of argument, we want to move away from employer-based insurance, which is not even the stated goal of what this bill is, but let's say that is something they intend to do. Is this the best way to accomplish it? And I think the concern is that not only will this lead to a massive erosion for a lot of small businesses to just drop it because they can't compete with the subsidy, the very generous subsidy, there's the taxpayer concern long-term as we continue to subsidize write these large checks to insurance companies every single year for the subsidy amount. But is there a better way? If we were to transition away from employer-based insurance, which I think those on the right and left, economists on the right and left would say there would be some benefit. I think there would be universal agreement that this is probably not the way to do it because of the bl blank check nature that the subsidy structure and how it's set up to the insurance companies. I think you would like to see reforms that at least cap the subsidy amount based on your income. Just to say, hey, if you make 150 FPL, this is how much you're gonna get. If you make 200%, this is how much you're gonna get. And you know what the insurance companies would do? They would design plans 
that meet that subsidy level. Instead, right now, it's whatever the delta is for the subsidy amount, they just keep getting paid more and more. And I think ultimately that's unsustainable going forward. And it's not, it could potentially hurt the patients. And I think taxpayers, generally speaking, will pull money away from other public priorities, whether it's infrastructure, national defense, or anything else. Those become a lot harder to pay for when so much of our economy is just being sunk into subsidizing health coverage. I was intrigued by your uh, Forbes article, which uh, did actually say, you know, that th these are some of the unintended consequences. These are some of the victims of the new uh, system. You, you mentioned some earlier. Uh, those with pre-existing conditions are are far better off in their employer system than than into uh, an ACA plan. Um, were you to have the ear of your, uh, I guess, where this is headed is to the Senate, uh, maybe a, a healthcare committee or a reconciliation committee. What would you rather this uh, uh, be written as? Uh, what would what would in a sense fix the problems that you identify in the Forbes article? Yeah, I mean, I think I would have some really candid conversations on whether we want to continue to extend the subsidies up to this middle income class to begin with, period, because of these unintended consequences. But if they were committed to keeping that upward pressure and expansion of that, then I would first and foremost advocate that they should at least cap the subsidy levels, as I just mentioned. That would at least bring some common sense and rationality to this, that people would then be focused about how do we offer the best product to individuals with a subsidy that meets the budget that has been allocated for this. Right now, it's a blank check. And I think, unfortunately, uh, when you have a blank check and you're subsidizing something, you get more of things you don't always want. And so as a result, we're seeing higher and higher premiums, larger and larger amounts of money going to health insurance companies. And we're not seeing if you're spending more money, we would want to at least see uh, an increase in the quality of care or the efficiency of how the care is developed. I don't think we've seen that since the ACA has passed or even in the last 30 years. So we look across the healthcare system as we've seen premiums go up 100%, 200% in a lot of markets. We haven't seen that what we see in technology and other industries, uh, an adjustment in efficiency or increase in quality. And I think that's ultimately the problem here and why this becomes unsustainable long term is that we're not seeing that, you know, think about your iPhone. It, you, you spend a lot more on a smartphone or an iPhone than we did 10 years ago, five years ago. But I think most people would say, yeah, we get a lot more value there. It's a computer in your hand, in your pocket. It's quite amazing what you get for paying a little bit more. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of that in healthcare. As a result, we, we see the prices varying significantly for the exact same services. We see them using the same machine that they used 10 years ago, but now charging 10 times more. For the same machine, there hasn't been an increase in technology. So while our healthcare system does have some really innovative areas, I think there's probably universal agreement based on personal experience for many of us, but also just looking across at the aggregate, there's significant room for improvement. We don't want to just keep subsidizing, uh, whether it's just the insurance card or the kinds of care that aren't delivering more value. So I want to uh, have time to focus uh, what uh, we're doing here in Massachusetts on, on healthcare. But before we leave the Build Back Better question, um, uh, I, I want to ask, is, is there anything in the bill? I mean, we've talked about subsidies and closing uh, gaps and, and maybe some of the unintended consequences. Is there anything in there that actually is reform oriented that will, in a sense, uh, bring market forces to bear on healthcare such that uh, we're getting uh, more value for our, our dollar? Or are we simply just throwing more money at a, a let's say, a dysfunctionally and very expensive system uh, uh, with the hope that consumers will be happy uh, that their uh, insurance bill is smaller? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I don't look at this bill and see a, a lot of silver linings. I think there's a couple that I would just highlight. Um, there is some provisions in there for reinsurance programs. And again, these are one of those kind of complicated mechanisms to try to make the cost of insurance uh, more affordable. It doesn't unfortunately drive down the cost of insurance, but at least helps uh, make sure that individuals are protected from some of the spikes. In essence, reinsurance is you're able to put money in and kind of reduce the cost of insurance going forward. So there's roughly $10 billion in the bill to start down that process for states to look at reinsurance programs. And a number of states that have started down this route, they have had some success, you know, premiums going down 10, 20%, depending on what the dynamics of what's going in the market. In essence, why you want to do this is for those that are uninsured that may be younger, and cost is a big expense for them. If you're able to have the premiums be a little bit less, some of them will come off the sideline and your risk profile goes down. You're a little bit healthier 
And so as a result, the premiums are able to go down. So there's, that's one mechanism. It's not a perfect one, doesn't, not a silver bullet, doesn't fix all the problems in healthcare, but it can be a, an effective way to try to tackle some of this, the increasing premium issue. The other one I might highlight is uh, one of the previous COVID bills had put in place a requirement that states could, uh, had to stop checking eligibility for those that are on the Medicaid program. And as a result, uh, during the public health emergency, so as a result, there's a number of individuals who no longer qualify for the program. Their income's too high. They've moved out of state, number, any number of reasons, and that they're still on the Medicaid program. The insurance companies, the managed care companies are being paid every month for their coverage. And there is a provision in this bill, if it were to pass and stay in the Senate version, that starting in April of 2022, states could at least restart eligibility redeterminations. Why does this matter? Well, Medicaid is run by states. And as a result, the states have to pay a portion of that cost. And so as individuals sit on the program, that means more and more state dollars are going to paying for people who aren't eligible for the program. And you have to find that money somewhere. So that comes from small businesses who have to pay slightly higher tax rates to pay for that. For individuals, you have to find more money to pay for that. So I hope that there's some bipartisan agreement, whether it's on this bill or another, that we are able to restart the eligibility determinations so that we make sure that we're only paying for Medicaid coverage for people who are in fact eligible. So to be clear, we're not uh, talking about uh, the proverbial uh, pushing uh, the woman off the cliff in the wheelchair uh, when we talk about eligibility. We're talking about people who had had no uh, scrutiny of their um, Medicaid application during COVID. And now in April of 2022, someone would uh, look at their file and say, look, uh, uh, respectfully, you make too much to be eligible for Medicaid. You need to be on uh, one of the more, uh, the, either the ACA or something else. Is that right? Correct. Yep. Or an individual has, I mean, think about it in New England. The states are close. If somebody were to move, um, the states don't do a great job communicating with each other on whether somebody's moved. They would at least at minimum say, you know, oh, this individual looks like they no longer live in our state. So we're going to stop paying the managed care company every month for somebody who is not even here. All right. And of course, that money being paid for the person who isn't here. Uh, is money that's not going to schools and roads and police and all the other great things we want from government. So a uh, costly mistake. So that, that's some good news. We were we had to look around quite a bit, but we found some good news there in the Build Back Better plan. Let's focus now uh, on Massachusetts. Uh, we've, uh, we were, I guess, pioneers in the uh, uh, role of health care reform. Um, and we got quite a bit of money uh, in uh, the American Rescue Plan Act. I think somewhere around $4 billion we're talking about. That's being debated up uh, on the top of Beacon Hill. Um, what can you say about uh, how that might be spent on healthcare here in Massachusetts? What are the issues being debated here? Sure. So the, the kind of status of where this is, is there has been a $4 billion bill that's made its way through the legislature. And there's been a lot of disagreement between the governor about who gets to appropriate this money or whether it's the legislature. And the legislature said in a 163 page bill, we're, we're going to tell you how to spend the, at least the first $4 billion. Now, now mind you, uh, additional uh, money went to the states, uh, excuse me, to the cities and towns that they have to spend as well. But the state is also funneling some of this money down. And one of the interesting initial observations in some of the press coverage was uh, there was quite a bit of earmarking in this bill that didn't really seem to be connected to healthcare or COVID related relief, you know, uh, refurbishing, uh, um, you know, gazebos in certain towns, uh, money going towards Irish social clubs, uh, road repaving, all, all those good sorts of Christmas tree uh, earmarks that we typically see in some of these bills. But, but putting it aside in the grand scheme of things, the, the bulk of this money I think is spent on areas that are public health related or healthcare related. Uh, there's millions of dollars spent for on um, local health boards, $200 million that they're allocating to local health boards some for data collection and other infrastructure. I think there's really good questions to be had about how did our public health infrastructure work during COVID? What could they have done better? Where did they fail? I think there will be continued debate here on how should this money actually be spent? And are we in a much stronger position going forward? Uh, there's $260 million that is being allocated to financially strained hospitals. And so again, this has been a perennial issue in the legislature about who qualifies as a financially strained hospital, how well run are these hospitals. And I think Pioneer's interest here is just around accountability and transparency of how this money will be ultimately spent to make sure that 
on the back end after spending these billions of dollars that we end up with a health system that is stronger you know, more efficiently run and this isn't just kind of being dumped into a black hole here but there's a number i mean we could literally spend 30 minutes going through all of the earmarks of money spent on behavioral health loan repayments for counselors which there's certainly a need here we hear almost every day of examples in which emergency rooms are strained by behavioral health cases in which there are not enough behavioral health beds going forwards. So it puts hospitals in a tough spot when they're trying to respond to COVID related issues when they have so many folks that are in crisis from a behavioral health standpoint uh, going forward. So th these are some of the overarching debates. It's a lot of money being spent on community health care centers and the behavioral health world going forward. The real discussion to be had going uh, going forward is just what sort of tracking and understanding will we have on how the money is actually being spent and whether it's making a positive impact or just being spent for the sake of spending it. Well, yeah, well, Josh, I would imagine one could be very sympathetic to the fact that uh, COVID-19 was an extraordinary strain on the healthcare world. So uh, financially stressed uh, firms could either be financially stressed because they're poorly run or financially stressed because uh, COVID imposed an extraordinary burden on, on that firm. How, who's in the business of figuring out which is which? H how do we know uh, that we're not merely subsidizing a, a, um, a dysfunctional uh, healthcare organization or whether uh, they were in the front lines uh, doing battle with COVID and uh, this extraordinary event, once, once we're past it, they can return to some sense of normalcy and that, that money will have been well spent. Uh, effectively keeping alive a firm that uh, endured a, a, an extraordinary strain? I think you're asking exactly the right question, Joe. I'm not sure that there's uh, great answers here in this bill or in the conversation on Beacon Hill. Uh, unfortunately, the political incentives are aligned here to not have some of those tough conversations. I mean, the other debate in this uh, bill that has received some attention has been around uh, payments for essential health workers and who qualifies for that. There's been some disagreement about uh, the governor's definition of that versus what the legislature, the legislature tries to set up a commission, a massive commission, I think it's over 30 people to determine who should qualify and how to get those payments out. And I think this is, this is where this governing gets really complicated really fast. I think there's general agreement that most people in the Massachusetts and other states were really appreciative of healthcare workers and others that were coming to work every single day during the most uncertain days of the pandemic and really putting themselves at, at risk. But once you start to get into conversations around teachers, social workers, foster parents, you know, garbage individuals working outside, I think it gets a little harder and a little trickier to find universal agreement on who gets these additional payments. So whether it's a large institution being given money just because they're a healthcare institution or involved in healthcare, or whether it's an individual person who the state is determining they wanna now give additional money. I think at minimum, there needs to be a robust public discussion about this, not just inside uh, the Golden Dome on Beacon Hill. But then ultimately, I think there needs to be some transparency about do we actually deliver this money what, what is a result of this money, particularly for the institutions? Are they actually investing the money so that they're better prepared for a pandemic long-term? Or are they spending this money in a way to just backfill salaries for individuals or others in which there are underlying concerns about whether this is a going concern going forward from the business side? So we're getting close to the, our, uh, the end of our time together. So I always like to ask us, um, particularly around uh, direct policy questions, uh, you mentioned the um, the governor and the, and the legislature having a, a healthy, lively debate on who whose prerogative it is to decide where this money is spent. If uh, Josh Archambault were king for a day or uh, an all-powerful governor, um, how would you want to see some of this money spent, knowing that you are a uh, uh, healthcare policy expert and 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 want to see uh, uh, the most uh, value for the buck and the most efficient use of that money to ensure that the most people can be helped. What, what would you do? Well, I mean, this, this money from the federal government was allocated to try to help with uh, pandemic preparedness. So for me, that would be the first and foremost of my focus. I, I think whether gazebos or helping the Wang and Schubert Theater uh, with money is probably not going to be near the top of my list. Um, so I think that's the first thing. And I think my criteria would be twofold. One is to make sure that we are understanding where there were gaps. 
where, where were their problems? Was it on the data side? Was it on the infrastructure side? Was it on the communication side? If we were to come into 2023 or 2025, what needs to be in place now that we don't have to make sure that our ability to continue in some sense of normalcy when a, another pandemic comes? Because inevitably there will be another one. How do we make sure that we have that flexibility and infrastructure in place to be able to, as a society in the state, move forward? Some of that is related to uh, human infrastructure. We don't have a, enough certain kinds of providers. And so I, I am sympathetic to looking at ways to increase the amount of uh, providers that we need to be flexible. I, I would make sure that there's a discussion about removing barriers that are in place. Some might have financial implications, some may not. And then finally, I probably wouldn't spend all the money if we can't find ways that actually meet towards those goals. And so perhaps whether it's returning the money, whether it's giving property tax relief, I mean, for individuals that were struggling to get to work, there, there is something here to be said that the, the help, most helpful thing for them going forward would be some sort of reduction in the cost of their living instead of just spending the money on some of these pet projects going forward. So for me, that's I would make sure that we have some pretty strong criteria by which we're trying to make these decisions, looking at how do we best prepare and how do we actually help people that were impacted by the pandemic? Well, I'm going to ask this not knowing the answer, but uh, this is, you know, healthcare and healthcare research is part of the policy, uh, part of the mission of uh, Pioneer. Are you planning on doing any research in, in a sense, preparing a plan that said, um, uh, this is what Massachusetts or the, the nation in general uh, should be doing to prepare for the next um, uh, pandemic, if it's uh, next year or 100 years hence? Uh, is there any research where we analyze what we did right and wrong and uh, lay out, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, uh, a menu or a, uh, a recipe for uh, moving forward uh, in, in the future? Yeah, it, you know, that's something that we have had conversations about, and there's a lot of our work that I think is very, very relevant to this conversation. Uh, the, the complex uh, answer to this, though, is that there's both a federal and a state discussion to be had here. Um, so at the state level, certainly uh, the questions that need to be had are what are the barriers that were in place pre-pandemic and maybe still are in place uh, that would allow the state, the health system to be a lot more flexible going forward. Th these are things that we've kind of touched on in some of our prior conversations, whether it is across state line telehealth or making sure that all providers can use telehealth whether it's um, allowing certain providers to have the flexibility to practice on their own for things that they've been trained to do, something called scope of practice, instead of always having to be have oversight or physical oversight, whether it's the ability for health institutions to have flexibility to move staff to different sites, there's some barriers to that that had to be waived during the pandemic, whether it's institutions having the flexibility to open more ICU beds without having to go through a massive bureaucratic process and application with the state to get permission to do so. There's a lot of things that the state could do on the policy side uh, moving forward. I, I certainly think Pioneer's done lots of work in the space around data reporting, whether it is in nursing homes or others, where there's certainly a lot of uh, improvement to be made there to make sure that when we do have something pop up, not only is it being flagged for the relevant state authorities, but the public is able to be informed and that data is easily accessible. So people understand what's what's going on, where the high risks are, where the cases are coming from, instead of feeling like they're ill-informed. And then for our podcast in the future, certainly a conversation to be had about what needs to happen at the CDC, at the FDA, uh, on vaccine development, if that's part of a pandemic response, that there's lots of opportunities there, I think, for improvement um, and ways to tweak even now. It doesn't have to be for a future pandemic. So people better understand what's going on, what the risks are. They can properly assess them for themselves and their families going forward. And so we can avoid some of the issues that we had in the past or the fact that governors or others had to waive a lot of these barriers that were in place. It's interesting. Everything you prescribe, I think, uh, is is uh, uh, pioneers' uh, research uh, going back twenty years. Uh, all, many of the provisions you describe as being making us more ready for the next pandemic is just good advice for healthcare in general. So there really doesn't seem to me, by my reckoning, and all the, all the shows we've done on healthcare and COVID, much much light between good healthcare reform and preparation for the next pandemic. They they seem like uh, almost identical prescriptions. 
I, I think there's some truth to that. <laughs> I mean, we don't need to make this overly complicated uh, going forward. Uh, you know, when you're sick, there's a lot of complexities to that. And so we want to make sure that we have the most flexible, uh, dynamic, innovative system that we can have. And a lot of that is looking at incentives and removing barriers to be able to address that, whether it's COVID related or whether it's other chronic condition related. That's a wonderful place to end the show. Uh, we, we tied it all together with a nice bow at the end. So thank you very much for joining the show again, Josh. You're, as always, uh, a very informed and, uh, and clear uh, uh, guest, uh, and, and our, our listeners are grateful for it. Great. Thanks, Joe. This has been another episode of Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute. If you enjoyed today's episode, there are several ways to support the show. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. It would make it easier for others to find Hubwonk if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. We're always grateful if you want to share Hubwonk with friends. If you have ideas for me or suggestions or comments about future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk.